Very warm welcome to West Worthing Evangelical Church for our online service on this Lord's Day morning. And we pray that God will be glorified as we worship him together, either at your home or wherever you may be. We pray that we may lift up the Lord Jesus Christ in this act of worship. The psalmist says, O give thanks to the Lord, call upon his name, make known his deeds among the people, sing to him, sing praise to him, tell of his wondrous works, glory in his holy name. Let the hearts of those who seek the Lord rejoice. Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that as we worship you on this morning, that we might glorify you. It is your day, it is the open day of worship, it is the record of Jesus' resurrection. And we thank you that we can come to you in this way. We thank you for the free and full access we have to you through Jesus Christ, your Son, our great High Priest. And we thank you for the promise that our sins will be washed away through his precious blood when we confess them. And we come to you in repentance and faith. And we do so now. Lord, whatever we've done, whatever our past history is, we thank you that we can be washed and cleansed in the blood of Jesus. And we thank you also that it's not just simply an act of forgiveness, it's an act of restoration. Because as the psalmist says, create in me a clean heart, O God, renew a right spirit within me. And we thank you for the renewal of that right spirit that comes to us when we put our faith in you through Jesus Christ. And so, Lord, we come anticipating your presence through your promises, through no righteousness of our own, through nothing we deserve, and yet through your grace. And we pray that this act of worship may be, as it were, in tune with your people throughout the world, that there be a great paean of praise ascending from earth to heaven as we gather this morning. We thank you for every blessing that you bestowed upon us, for all the good things that have happened to us, known and unknown. We thank you, dear Lord, for protecting us and guiding us. And we pray that this act of worship may be steeped in that sense of gratitude to a gracious and a glorious God. We come to you in the name that is above every name, the name of Jesus. Amen. Our first reading is taken from Psalm 40. Psalm 40, I'm reading from the English Standard Version. The psalmist says, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction, out of the mighty bog, and set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. He put a new song in my mouth, a song of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not turn to the proud, to those who go astray after a lie. You have multiplied, O Lord my God, your wondrous deeds and your thoughts toward us. None can compare with you. I will proclaim and tell of them, yet they are more than can be told. In sacrifice and offering you have not delighted, but you have given me an open ear. Burnt offering and sin offering you have not required. Then I said, Behold, I have come in the scroll of the book. It is written of me, I delight to do your will, O my God. Your law is within my heart. I have told the glad news of deliverance in the great congregation. Behold, I have not restrained my lips, as you know, O Lord. I have not hidden your deliverance within my heart. I have spoken of your faithfulness and your salvation. I have not concealed your steadfast love and your faithfulness from the great congregation. As for you, O Lord, you will not restrain your mercy from me. Your steadfast love and faithfulness will ever preserve me. For evils have encompassed me beyond number. 
My iniquities have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head. My heart fails me. Be pleased, O Lord, to deliver me. O Lord, make haste to help me. Let those who be put to shame and disappointed altogether, who seek to snatch away my life, let those be turned back and brought to dishonour who delight in my hurt. Let those be appalled because of their shame, who say to me, Aha, aha. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation continually say, Great is the Lord. As for me, I am poor and needy, but the Lord takes thought for me. You are my help and my deliverer. Do not delay, O oh my God. Our next hymn is Guide Me, O Thou Great Jehovah. Shall we come to God in prayer? Let us pray. Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you that we can come to you once more in prayer. That in and through our great High Priest, the Lord Jesus Christ, we can come to that throne of grace. Grace sufficient for all our needs. Grace that is poured out abundantly upon each one of us. And so this morning we come to you not for ourselves but for others. We think of the world in which we live. We think of the things that are happening in this world. This pandemic that is sweeping across the nations. The enmity that's in the hearts of people, one toward another. Simply because someone's different. Someone has a different politics or a different religion. Or a different coloured face. Oh Lord, we pray for your forgiveness. Lord, we thank you that all human beings are created fundamentally in your image. 
And it is only sin that has marred that image. And so we pray for this gospel, this wonderful message of salvation that we've already read about in the 40th Psalm that speaks of a salvation that is of God, that speaks of your mercy, that speaks of your grace. And we pray that as that message is proclaimed across the world today, that many may come into a living relationship with you through Jesus Christ. Bless your dear servants. Bless your church. Bless all those who seek to proclaim your name as the psalmist did so long ago. We pray for the government of the world. We pray for the leaders of nations or the awesome responsibility they have at this moment. We pray for all those scientists and medical practitioners who are seeking to alleviate the temporal suffering of mankind. We think of all those who are caught up in this pandemic, those whose lives have been shattered, not just health-wise, but through financial difficulties, through business, through unemployment, all these things. Lord, we just lift them into your presence this morning that you may touch each one. And we pray, most gracious God, that as a result of what has been happening, that people will realise the frailty of our human race. With all the technology we have, all the advances we've made scientifically and in so many different areas, we thank you for that. But something like this makes us conscious of our frailty. And we pray that in doing so, we might realise that there is a sovereign overruling everything. You are our King. And we thank you that we can look beyond this world, look beyond this passing time into eternity, and know that in Jesus Christ we have a safe and secure haven. Oh Lord, may many come to know that. Pray for our nation, our Prime Minister, our Royal Family, for all who reign and rule over us. Grant them all that they need at this time. We pray for those that we know and love within our families, many who are suffering in various ways. We pray for those who have been brought into depression through what's been happening around us. Oh Lord our God, have mercy, we pray. Pray for the church in our land. We pray for the opportunity you've given to your church to proclaim the good news. May it be taken gladly with both hands and used for your glory. Lord, we pray that as we open your word together this morning, that we might behold wondrous things, because we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. Our second Bible reading is taken from the first chapter of Paul's letter to the Galatians, Galatians and chapter 1, and once more I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible. Paul, an apostle, not from men, nor through man, but through Jesus Christ and God the Father, who raised him from the dead, and all the brothers who were with me to the churches of Galatia, grace to you, and peace from God our Father and the Lord Jesus Christ who gave himself for our sins to deliver us from this present evil age according to the will of our God and Father to whom be glory for ever and ever. Amen. I'm astonished that you have so quickly deserted him who called you in the grace of Christ and are turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you another gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. For am I now seeking the approval of man or of God? Or am I trying to please man? 
If I were still trying to please man, I would not be a servant of Christ. In his letter to the Romans, the Apostle Paul says, I am not ashamed of the gospel of our Lord Jesus Christ, for it is the power of God unto salvation. This letter to the churches in Galatia is a letter that's dealing with a fundamental problem that has arisen, a serious problem, a fatal problem. He had preached the gospel to them. And we're told, if we look through the book of Revelation, that, uh, the book of Galatians, that they had welcomed Paul's message with open arms. They believed in this message and they'd been baptised. And they'd received the Holy Spirit, all the marks of a people who have been transformed by the glorious gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. And they had for a time gone on in this holy faith. But something had gone wrong. Something had driven them off course. Something that was so serious that Paul had to deal with it in this letter. And it's something that has happened to the church in every generation, and it's something that each individual Christian must be aware of. If you're a Christian, you are someone who has been transformed by this gospel. You are made aware by the Holy Spirit of your sin. You're brought to a place where you saw that Jesus Christ, that Christ alone was the only one who could deal with that sin. And you had come to him in re re uh, repentance and faith and been reconciled to God through Jesus Christ. You've been transformed. This is exactly what happened to these people. And if it's happened to you, then rejoice. If it hasn't happened to you, then come to Christ and make it happen. Or better still, he will make it happen. But something had gone wrong. What had gone wrong? Well, if you go through the book of Galatians, you see quite quickly that uh, they'd strayed from the true gospel. There's a, a wilderness principle, isn't there? However sophisticated we come, however much concrete we put down and buildings we erect, if we just let them be, over a period of time, and it would be a long, long time, but over that period of time, the wilderness will take over. If it's neglected, paths will begin to crack, and as a crack appears across a path, so a weed will grow, a plant will grow, the crack will get bigger, a bigger plant will grow, and over a period of time, there will be a forest, a jungle, surrounding that which man had built up, pristine. And that wilderness principle operates in the human life too. If we neglect the things of God, even though we may be transformed by the precious blood of Jesus, washed in that blood, changed completely, if we neglect that, if we leave it be and just carry on in our own way, it won't be long before the weeds grow, the plants grow, the ivy begins to come round, and it's not long before the building begins to crumble. And this is what was happening in the churches in Galatia, and this is what can happen in your life and my life. And why was this? Well, it was the influence of a certain group of people. They're called Judaizers. This particular issue was an issue of circumcision, an issue of becoming a Jew before becoming a Christian. What had happened is that Paul had preached the gospel, and these were Gentiles. These weren't Jewish people. These were people who came to know Jesus Christ and rejoiced in the presence of the God of Israel. And there were people in the church who said, you know, this is a wonderful thing, but they're not Jewish. They haven't been circumcised. They're not completely right with God. They've got to obey the law as well as this faith in Jesus Christ. Legalism. And it's very interesting because legalism creeps in in so many ways. We're not just dealing with a Jewish-Gentile issue. We're dealing with what's in our hearts. We can become legalistic. We take the Bible. The Bible is the living word of God that leads us to Jesus Christ. The Bible speaks of this wonderful God right from Genesis through to Revelation. 
the promises he made, the laws he gave to his people. And we could become people of the book. But the book could become a legal document for us if we're not careful. We could stop short of that grace and start to think that our salvation depends on what we do. Our salvation depends on the prayers we pray. Our salvation depends upon how we keep his law. Of course we are to keep his law. But Paul says the law was our schoolmaster, was put in charge of us to lead us to Christ. And we could get to the point where we've become so legalistic that we don't fall short of the presence of Jesus Christ. And this is what these Judaisms are seeking to do. Also, there was this influence here in uh, chapter 4 uh, of uh, ritualism, a ritualistic attitude, a cultural attitude. He says uh, you, you, you observe days, months, seasons, years. There were certain days that were set aside to be holy, as it was in the days of Israel. There were feast days, all kinds of days. But one can get so superstitious that if one doesn't keep that certain day, something's going to happen. The day becomes more important than the person for whom that day represents or the person to whom that day leads us into a place of worship. And there was attempts to even exclude Gentiles from the church of Jesus Christ. Exclusivism, racism, if you like. The Jewish Christians thought that maybe they were one step above anybody else. So if a Gentile came to know Jesus Christ, then really they weren't a, a proper Christian. They weren't a kind of Christian that we could have total fellowship with. And a division would begin to occur in the church simply because some people were excluded And there was the question of Paul's authority, egotism. You know, if you look at the history of the church and the history of cults, you see one of the most driving factors is the leadership of each particular cult or sect or whatever it may be. And if you look beyond the theological differences that they present, you'll see that there was an egotistical leader who really wanted to attract people to himself or herself. The human ego is very powerful. This is why Paul says, I'm crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ lives in me. The life I now live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. All these are human factors, and factors that we must be beware of. And so when Paul writes this letter, he's trying to make us aware of this, but he's also giving us means by which we can deal with this. And I want to this morning just focus on uh, verses 6 to 10. Paul is saying this, I'm astonished that you are so quickly deserting him who calls you in the grace of Christ and turning to a different gospel. He's beginning his defense against the legalists and he's astonished by what's happened. He's appalled by what's happened. They're seeking to change the very nature of the gospel by teaching that salvation by grace through faith is insufficient. And so he begins by shaming them, the shame of turning to a different gospel here in verse 6. We're told by scientists that humans are the only animals that blush. Well, I'm not sure how true that is. But why was he so astonished? Well, firstly, because they were deserting the one who had called them. They were deserting Christ himself. The gospel is about a person, not about a theological system. The gospel is simply about faith in this person called Jesus Christ. And any perversion of the gospel, any straying from the gospel, any change in the gospel is deserting Jesus Christ. Now, you can imagine how Paul would be astonished by this. If Christ saved you, if you're relying on Christ and Christ alone for your salvation, why are you deserting him? It doesn't make sense to me. 
But also they were deserting Paul himself. He was the instrument through which they were called. They were turning aside from this man who had brought them into a living relationship with the Lord Jesus Christ. And when someone ministers to us, either a preacher or in a personal way, or in whatever way, we have an attachment to them. And it's quite right that we do so. We're not looking to them. We're looking to Jesus. But they were the person or the people who were instrumental in bringing us to this relationship with Jesus Christ. So we have this natural affinity with them, a natural love for them, a respect for them. But by turning to another gospel, they were turning their backs on the Apostle Paul. Paul had preached to them, and now they were going the other way. They were deserting the one who brought them to Christ. If you read the biography of Charles Haddon Spurgeon, you'll read of the downgrade controversy, how in the latter part of the 19th century, the churches became liberal, the great theology of the day began to downgrade the scriptures, even the divinity of our Lord Jesus Christ. They began to explain the Bible in terms of myth. And Spurgeon stood against that. He stood for the wonderful truth of scripture, the infallibility of scripture and Christ alone. And Spurgeon had been instrumental in bringing many people into the Christian ministry as bringing many people to Christ himself. And one by one, many of those that he had fathered in the faith embraced this new theology. He felt deserted, abandoned because of that. And this is exactly what the Galatians, Judaizers, these people who had come into the church and the people who accepted this new teaching were doing to Paul. They were deserting him. But what was even more ludicrous is that they were turning their back on freedom. They were going back to slavery. It's like Israel when they wanted to go back into Egypt because the going got tough in the wilderness. They thought we're better off in Egypt. Even though we're slaves, we get some food. We get some kind of security. At least it's uh, the devil you know is better than the devil you don't know. That's their kind of theology or philosophy at the time. And this is what those people were doing. They were turning their back on the freedom that they had in Jesus Christ. They were going back into religion, going back into slavishly observing the things that they used to observe until they were brought out of that. By Jesus Christ. It's like a, an habitual criminal who is unable to cope with freedom and seeks to go back to prison. Was there any hope for people in this situation? Well, there was. There was still hope that they could be turned back from this path, and this is why Paul writes this letter. And here's the folly of turning to a different gospel. Verses 6 and 7 tell us, I'm astonished you are so quickly deserting him who called you in the grace of Christ from turning to a different gospel. Not that there is another one, but there are some who trouble you and want to distort the gospel of Christ. What is this different gospel? Well, Paul says it's no gospel at all. And someone has translated this as a kind of evil good news something that is alien to the gospel that it seeks to nullify the power of that gospel to save sinners from the judgment of God. Paul says in Romans, doesn't he, they exchange the truth of God for a lie. What they were doing was not just producing another brand of the same thing. There are some people who, who see it like this. There is this gospel... There is this wonderful message of salvation. And all these other things that creep in and uh, seek to nullify it, uh, they're merely just another brand of the same product. People see this in differences between the churches. 
And there, there are certain similarities between churches. And churches that believe in the gospel and practice the gospel and preach the gospel, as Paul preached it, who might differ on baptism or church government or some other issue on what songs they sing and all other kinds of things. They're still brothers and sisters in Christ. It's still the one gospel, but there are those who seek to nullify this gospel, who bring in ritual who bring other observances, all the things that we've spoken about right at the beginning. They're not just producing another product, another brand, another flavour, as some people have said. They are producing another gospel, which is no gospel at all. We cannot have fellowship with such. Who was it who was causing the confusion here? Well, it was these people who said you had to go back to Judaism. Now, this had already been dealt with by the church in the book of the Acts of the Apostles at the Council of Jerusalem. The great issue then was, what about these Gentiles who become Christians? We've got to remember that Jesus was born a Jew, that the apostles were all Jews, and at the outset, the church was Jewish. But God had not intended it to remain like that. God had promised even the Old Testament that the church would proclaim this gospel to the Gentiles too and we'd all be one in Christ Jesus as Paul has written in another place. There is no Jew nor Gentile, bond nor free, male or female, all one in Christ Jesus. And the church in Jerusalem had to deal with that and they dealt with that. And so this had already been dealt with. And many of the issues that we face today have already been dealt with in history. The church has faced these things before. None of us, whether it's as a church or as an individual Christian, is facing anything that's unique. This is something that's happened before and been dealt with before, which is why we read the scriptures, which is why we build on this faith that we have. It's a common thread that runs throughout church history. And what are the consequences of turning to this different gospel? Well, what we read here is quite stunning. We think of the Apostle Paul, we think of his knowledge of the grace of God and his graciousness in dealing with Christians. He's a preacher who preaches forgiveness, who preaches mercy. But that doesn't mean to say he's tolerant. What we read here is quite stunning. This is how he speaks of these people who are seeking to pervert the gospel. Not just brothers who've gone astray, not just Christians who have a different uh, view of things, but he says this. In verse 8, But even if we or an angel from heaven should preach to you a gospel Contrary to the one we preach to you, let him be accursed. That's powerful in itself. But what follows? As we have said before, so now I say again, if anyone is preaching to you a gospel contrary to the one you received, let him be accursed. Literally from the Greek, let him be an anathema. Execrable, detestable, have nothing to do with them. No participation, no communion with God. That's a pretty powerful statement. But it shows how crucial this gospel is for human destiny. If anyone should come along and in any shape or form distort it, Mar it, cover it, change it. They are doing something so diabolical. They are leading people away from the path of righteousness. Leading people away from the presence of God. Leading people away or seeking to lead people away from their eternal destiny. That's why Paul says, let them be an anathema, let them be accursed. And he repeats it to make sure 
he gets his point home. This gospel is the most wonderful message a human being can hear. It is so simple, so profound, so life-transforming in its purity. And its purity is simple that Jesus himself saves sinners. Come to Christ and you come to God. Repent and believe the good news and your life is changed. Your sins are forgiven. You have a new and living way to walk in with God. The Holy Spirit is given. Don't let anything, anything spoil that. Don't let anything creep into your life. If you're already a Christian, don't let anything creep in. Any of these false teachings. Anything well up within your own being. We, we still have a fallen nature. We still struggle with sin. We still struggle with doubts and fears. But don't let anything take your eyes away from Jesus. And in the church, we must not let anything creep in. We might want to be popular. We might want more people to come and worship with us. And so we might think, of, well, we are downgrade this a little bit. It's not really downgrading. It's just really emphasizing one thing. We, 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 we won't be so hard in our preaching. We won't preach about hell and judgment and all these things. We just tell people that God loves them. Of course, that's true. God loves them. But that love is the love that steeped in judgment. Because God loves people so much, he wants them to be holy. And he has promised judgment upon sin. And that judgment is as part of the gospel as his love. And the way that he dealt with that judgment was the most wonderful demonstration of his love. He placed that judgment, that condemnation on his only begotten son. That's the wonder of the gospel in all its purity. Don't let anything take that gospel away or snatch that gospel away from the life of the church or from your life. Shall we pray? Almighty God and loving Heavenly Father, we thank you for this wonderful gospel. We think of the life of the church and the wonder of people coming together from all kinds of backgrounds, different nationalities, races, backgrounds, all kinds of things. We thank you, most gracious God, that each one is called into your presence through Jesus Christ, and we are all one in Christ Jesus. But we're aware too, Lord, of all those distracting things that might seem innocuous at the time, might just seem another kind of branding of the product, might just seem to be just another aspect or view or perspective. And yet, Lord, distort this gospel, twist this gospel, make this gospel heavy instead of light. Those who try to turn out the light of your gospel shining in our hearts. Those who heap upon your people all kinds of things that they must do before they can be a Christian. Lord, may we just rejoice in the freedom of this gospel. May we learn to reject all those things that prevent us from walking with you. Because we ask it in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, next time we're going to look at uh, maybe how Paul deals with some of these issues that we've been speaking about this morning. Our closing hymn is When This Passing World Is Done.
And shall we close with the grace, the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all evermore. Amen. Amen.